This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. Science and archaeology have gone far to explain the past of human cultures. Ancient civilizations that have since eroded into the sands of time, leaving behind traces for us to uncover and interpret. However, sometimes these artifacts hold surprises. Forms of technology that perhaps should not be there. Explanations of these anachronistic technologies have come to explode conventional narratives about the limitations of ancient cultures, and reconceptualize the abilities of our distant historical relatives. Tonight, we examine some examples of these technologies, some that have gained the attentions of top academic researchers in the field, and others that have withered into the realm of pseudoscientific blasphemy. Join us on Into the Portal for an all-new adventure into the mysteries of human history and ancient technologies. Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. Welcome back, everyone. Mm-hmm. Brand new Sunday, brand new week. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we are discussing some really cool stuff t- today. Yeah, so we're getting into some, um, well, ancient technologies is uh, sort of the one blanket term for it, but we're basically breaking down today's episode into sort of three three stories, you could say. There'll mm-hmm. be a few tangents from those stories, but we're basically dealing with a few, some ancient things for you guys tonight. And one of them is sort of definitively real, and we're going to break it down authentic wise. One of these things is sort of definitively a hoax, and we'll leave it up to you to decide. And then we have another uh, aspect of the episode that's sort of somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is this is our bread and butter going into the ancient past, <laughs> so really excited about it. But before uh, we jump into this, we have our, our tiny bit of housekeeping like we yeah. normally have. Mm-hmm. So um, just wanted to say welcome to our newest patron, Chris L. Um, thank you so much for yes. uh, joining us on our Patreon community. We are mm-hmm. so stoked. It's growing steadily, which is really fun. And uh, we've got some really cool stuff coming at you guys, I think, like, later tonight, actually. I we're... believe either tonight or tomorrow yeah. we should have that available. So we'll have a mini all. episode coming at you real, real soon. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, welcome to the group. Welcome, welcome. As well, we do have a couple of new reviews this week um, from our U.S. iTunes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this one, the first one I'm going to read actually came in a few days ago, and we had a bit of a laugh over this because... You're not going to read the whole thing, are you? I'm not going to read the whole thing. No, no, no. (laughs) But it was by um, a particularly negative person because I always go back, like I always hit on their name just Mm -hmm. to, just to reference, be like, what else are they giving reviews for? And what kind of reviews are those? Like, is this just like a negative Nancy or what? Right. But anyways, yeah, we had one from Amora V and she was basically saying that it's a stressful show. Stressful, man. So stressful. Gave us two stars. (laughs) Dang. I'm surprised it wasn't one. But it's like, why I would know. you even give us two? Thanks. And because I actually looked at her other reviews, and a lot of them were just ones. Well, I it's guess like we ones can, across the board. We can feel special then. I know, <laughs> but it's kind of annoying because she goes into the idea that we just look on Wikipedia. <laughs> and trust me, yeah. people, no, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, like I will, we will reference Wikipedia in the episode sometimes because they're a great starting point, and they do often give you a wealth of resources in the actual reference section. So if you can track those down and they have links to them, then it can be quite useful. Right. But we definitely do not do that. And she picked on her voodoo episode of all. Yeah, I thought that was pretty, it's pretty funny, right? right? Like kind of ironic considering it was pretty much one of our most well-researched episodes. Um, And most academic academic sources, right? Yeah. More peer-reviewed sources for that one than any other one. So just, just word of advice, like if you're going to troll someone online, just, just take one second and look 
at the sources before. Yeah. Like, if you're going to pick any episode, that was the worst one to pick right? to, like, call us out for that. So it's kind of hilarious. Pretty dumb. Anyway, but we had a really uh, positive really, one, too. We had a really, really good one, and this was by said Nance, and he says, or she says, sorry, um, that this is a great addition to the Esoteric Podcast Collector, five stars, and that basically... Uh, the opposite of what the other person had to say, where it, we have an endearing chemistry, natural conversation. It's cool. not a dry, scholarly lecture-style podcast with the most extensive research out there, which they say is not a critique, but it's more like a bunch of friends discussing weird topics that are they're knowledgeable and passionate about, yeah. instead of an intensive academic study. So thank you. You hit the nail on the thank head. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's really basically exactly that. what we want to be, right? Yeah. And even ends it off saying it's well-produced and accessible delivery, which I like, right? Because that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. So thank you, said Nance. Thank we you very much. appreciate that a lot. We appreciate everyone's reviews. Who's left one? So yeah, thank you all. And uh, if you haven't yet, hop on there. Leave us a review. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Are you ready to jump into this? Let's do it. Sweet. Let's do it. Okay. So we are going to kick off tonight's episode with... An ancient technology known as the Antikythera Mechanism. This was first brought to our attention by one of our um, listeners, actually, Ian, over in the UK. That's so right. Thank yeah. you, Ian. That was a really cool article you sent over. Definitely. And this is really neat, this particular piece of technology. It is being referred to as the Philosopher's Guide to the Galaxy. Very cool. And I thought this was a really cool way to sum up the um, importance of this device. This is a quote from uh, just a Washington Post article. Okay. It says here, In this very small volume of messed up, corroded metal, you have packed in there enough knowledge to fill several books telling us about ancient technology, ancient science, and the way in which these interacted with the broader culture of the time. It would be hard to dispute that this is um, the single most information-rich object that has been uncovered by archaeologists from ancient times, end quote. Wow. So that, That's really a pretty cool. profound statement right there. Yes. So, I mean, like, okay, so, yeah, you're, you're kind of taking the reins for this first part of the episode. So, like, before, because I've got tons of questions here I want to <laughs> throw at you, too, like I'm sure people listening will have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, before we really get into the meat of deciphering what this thing is, like, what what was the story? Like, where is it from? Where, where, where was this thing found? Okay, so it's basically called the Antikythera Mechanism because it was found off of a Greek island called Antikythera. And yes. essentially, um, the Such story... Such a cool name, just have to say. Like, Greek <laughs> word. Like, what a what a cool word. Well, cool name. essentially, I honestly thought it was kind of like a another term for, like, a cipher or something or some ah. sort of code, but it turns out... It yeah, does just, sound like that, doesn't it? It's very Greek sounding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but essentially, this was discovered about 100 years ago. It was, I believe, um, 1900 okay. when it was first uncovered, the entire shipwreck, right. that, that I mean. And essentially, there was a sponge diver who was sponging in the area, collecting his sponges. Okay. His name was Elias Stadiatos, and he just came across this ancient Roman cargo ship that was believed to have sunk over 2,000 years ago okay. in this Aegean Sea. Right. So, Okay. The actual sinking is believed to have been around 60 BC, um, and a lot of the dating was obviously done by um, carbon dating and of the objects that were found within, because this was a massive haul yeah. of impressive um, artifacts, uh, all sorts of... It was just like a treasure trove of all sorts of things, like really valuable statues, um, tons of jewelry. Right. And then among all of these things, well, okay, I'll give a few examples. For uh, one example that I thought was really cool, they found a set of, I believe, four horses of varying degrees of decay that were all carved from marble, and they were life-size. And wow. very cool. And they also found a life-size bronze spear um, nearby, and they believe this was um, part of an entire set that included a chariot and a full life-size bronze statue of a person. Crazy. So just, like, really amazing, really well-crafted um, artisanal pieces. Yeah, like, work. well, the one uh, short mini-doc or whatever we watched, like, basically said, like, at the time, this was, and still is to, to date, pretty much, like, the biggest sort of treasure trove of like marble mm -hmm. marble uh, other other bronze and different mm -hmm. like statues and things like that like ever found mm -hmm. which is pretty, jewels, pretty crazy all of it and but most notably what they found was an object that was very corroded um highly calcified 
but it was very interesting on the surface. It had this, like, sort of, like, inscriptive, like, gear-like thing. So they brought it up to the surface, and immediately it broke into three different pieces because it was just so corroded. Uh, but it was about 20 centimeters high, and it featured, like I said, this cylindrical, or circular, sorry, crown gear. But very, very, very poor shape. Right. Broke broke apart, Um and they only had, like, a small fragment of the actual entire uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's now theorized that there's up to 60 working gears. I think in the um, 1950s, when the initial sort of analysis was being done, this was over, yeah, so over 50 years go by after this thing's found. And they don't really know what it is. Right. So that's the interesting part. It's like they have parts of it. Yeah. They can kind of see these inscriptions but it wasn't until two years after it was brought to the surface that it was examined by some Greek expert. I believe he was, oh, he was like a, oh, I can't remember his exact title off the top of my head. But anyways, he was in the that. field. Sure. <laughs> and essentially, um, he saw these more like notable inscriptions and he discovered essentially that this is much more than just a piece. Because they originally just thought it was just a piece of a... Um, a just a statue or right. something, something ornate, but mm -hmm. not something that actually had a function. Right. Some, some, yeah, some more exactly. grandiose purpose. Exactly. Right. So yeah, he basically, he was the first one to sort of say that this has more significance to ancient technological sort of uh, like, you know, the evolution of such. This is one of those things where it's like, thank God that it was kept. You know what I mean? Because it's mm, like, it's yeah. one of those situations where it's like, you find a, treasure trove of statues and different things and then this very obscure corroded just essentially piece of metal it doesn't look like anything valuable to mm -hmm. the to like an untrained eye right mm -hmm. so the fact that it was actually kept because how many times in these stories have we come across things where it's like yeah it was sent in and lost or it was exactly. thrown away or this that and the other thing so or or like we've seen so much yeah exactly that like with the smithsonian they just lose stuff all the it's time like what they is need to hire on one guy here? just as their anti-loss prevention person <laughs> One guy. <laughs> well, uh, clearly they have zero guys. guys. <laughs> a couple guys. <laughs> or girls. Got, you know what I'm saying? A couple like, of people. <laughs> they got nothing going on right now. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, so like I said, like essentially now in um, 2018, they've since uncovered, there's been several different investigations and different expeditions down to the ship, but they believe there's up to 60 working mechanisms, or sorry, working gears within the mechanism. Yeah. And um, one expert who who was like an engineering historian, he actually um, began fashioning his own version. And I believe he did this in about 2002. And essentially he, he believes like that this is very, like it's obviously like a lot of math and like it could fill, like we said, like textbooks and textbooks worth of knowledge of like the universe and just um, astronomy and all that kind of stuff and the, the forces that are at work. Well, and that's just it. Like just to, just to sort of build the tension for how exciting this was like for, you know, people looking into it in the fifties. It's like, yeah, like you said, nobody knew what it was for. And we're trying to basically like, that's just the idea of what it could be used for is crazy, right? Like exactly. whether, whether or not it's for just astronomy or some greater purpose. Like, we Well, still we're going to get into that, all of that, right? Because there's multiple functions that this right. thing was responsible for. Oh. But what I was going to say was that um, this guy, this uh, historian, he actually came up with his own working model. And he, uh, in this one documentary we watched, he actually came up, he fashioned one of the gears right on screen and took mm -hmm. him. He said, he's like, oh, this would take me about, or take the ancient um, engineer about half an hour. Yeah. And using simple chisels and tools and files. Right. So it's not as if this is like, you know, some ancient alien technology that's like insane crazy. It's just a lot of information really just is beautifully um, represented in this one mechanism, yeah. which is just, that is, that is the honest beauty of this whole thing totally. and for me and, and just the fascination part of it. Absolutely. But yeah, no, okay, so we're on to this thing. So basically, 1902, um, they kind of un uncover these inscriptions, the word sun and the word Aphrodite it etched into the ancient surface. And then about 50 years continue until this physicist and science historian named Derek de Sola Price purchased or purchased, published his findings <laughs> <laughs> um, in the Scientific American magazine. So he was the first one to declare that this is an example of the first ever known computer made by man. A computer. 
So it gets even crazier, right? Yeah. So let's just let that sink in, everyone. So this is a computer that's over 2,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not a computer like MacBook computer. But the idea of something that works on its own independently on a hand crank. On a hand crank, yeah. And and after that crank's, you know, been been primed or whatever, essentially think of like a watch that runs on your pulse, except a million times more detailed. Exactly. What I picture in my head is something very similar in size to a phonograph Mm, and similar hand crank mechanism. And it's actually believed to... Um, have been enclosed in a wooden box at one point. Which, of course, is lost now. Well, it's, well, it's just rotted away yeah. underwater. But <laughs> they actually do make the comparison to a laptop. It's like, it's a very similar um, interface. size. And exactly, very similar interface. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Like but, the display on the front, like you would have just like on a computer. Like, well, totally. On and then you have all the right? gears, everything working behind the surface. Right. Which is very cool. Yeah, very cool. So, yeah, so basically revolutionized what they thought um, Greek histor- or Greek technologists were capable of doing. Mm-hmm. And so Derek de Sola Price, after he kind of made this initial very grandiose um, declaration that it was the very first computer, because like before that, the only ever um, declarations of that were about like 19, or sorry, no, not 1914s, um, <laughs> the 1400s or 1500s, like okay. there were similar medieval technologies, which yeah. we didn't really look into. But anyways, it's basically believed that this is a complex clock-like structure is what he believed, this Derek de Sola Price, and that it calculated the movements of stars and planets. And that at the time, he believed that there was about 30 different bronze gears that belonged to this thing, and about 2,000 characters. Since then, they've uncovered way more, so I think it's approximately 60 gears, and maybe close to 3,500 characters, um, if I have, remember that right. So significantly more detailed. Totally, yeah. So like we alluded to, it's all powered by hand crank. So when um, the person turns the crank, the gears of the contraption move, and um, these gears are attached to separate needles on the face of the machine. And essentially these needles would all, they've since been lost, but they all would have had these orbs that represent different planets, the five known planets of the time. Right. And so that would be Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And and they obviously thought that all these were rotating around the Earth. Earth. Yes. So, very cool, right? So you get like this mechanized miniaturized version of the cosmos right which is fucking crazy. brilliant right totally crazy it's it's, it's freaking greedy <laughs> no it really is though it really is it is um the what what the interesting question though to me is it's like obviously okay first of all there's a lot of well, there's more than one inter- interesting question you know who made it obviously why did they make it is the big one and there could be various reasons mm. why um and we have a few of them that we're going to get into obviously but it's like to me, this seems like something that's clearly more than just a slightly more advanced calendar for when you're planting your crops and things like that. There's oh, yeah. more to this that that's there's something behind this. There's, there's a ton more behind it. And a lot of it is actually based off of um, Babylonian arithmetic and um, these progression cycles that um, are basically lunar eclipse cycles. Right. So a lot of the so basically there's about three different calendars that are represented on this um, device. So one is the Egyptian calendar and there's also calendars for the lunar months slash years. So like that thing they refer to in our the article or it wasn't an article it was a documentary called um the antikythera device decoded i think so right yeah and um we'll put that up on our it sources for everyone our, yeah for sure but essentially there was this thing they called um an 18 year um period and i was yeah. like we'd never heard of that before no, but bizarre. essentially what it is it's just these soro cycles which um basically um chart out when we're going to have lunar eclipses mm-hmm. and so basically the antikythera mechanism charts these cycles these sono cycles soro cycles sorry and these lunar eclipses that happen down to the hour and they don't even do just that they actually include the color that the moon will be at at every particular point along the way yeah so it could be a black eclipse or it could be a red eclipse like the the moon could be several different shades and so this was able to plot that out strategically and predict it into the future yeah D- so, down to within the hour. Exactly. And it was the same thing for the solar eclipse. And with the solar eclipse, they could literally tell down to, I don't know exactly how many, like, <laughs> right. what the measurement solar was. Right, solar and lunar, right. Solar yeah, and lunar. Both of them. And with the solar, they could li- literally predict the exact um, angle and degree of the, the shadow cast being cast right. by, by the sun. 
at at that hour during that solar eclipse. Totally. And so so when we were watching that documentary, this has huge ramifications in Greek culture, not only just for, like, say, um, astrology and that type of thing, like, knowing what sort of quadrant and even just, like, the the cycle. What's that called again with Gemini and Sagittarius and all this kind of stuff? Ooh, don't I? Um, I don't know. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. We're dumb. The, not the astrology cycle, but it's like basically the I didn't take any horoscopes. No, oh, no, it's not the horoscopes. No. <laughs> What's that thing? Anyways, whatever. okay. Somebody reach out to us who knows uh, a little bit more Greek Greek history. No, it's not Greek. We use it all the time. I don't even know what you're talking. about. Well, it about. is Greek, but you know what I mean, like with the the different plots in the sky, right? There's Capricorn. Oh, oh, there's oh, oh, God! There's... Like the uh, yeah, like constellations. Yeah, essentially. Sure. So it had that calendar, right? So right. you knew which phase we were in essentially are we in gemini are we in aries are we in whatever the question like i just said but essentially why but to finish that thought Mm -hmm. why right exactly for war it was highly um strategic right for war purposes okay and war strategy and we are given the example in that documentary um of an ancient greek force that was off the shores of syracuse in uh, 413 bce right and they didn't heed the warning of an oracle that predicted a red eclipse and basically it would spell disaster for the greeks if it was red and they disregarded it and went ahead and lost about half their ships and it was a, a red eclipse so obviously this was highly important to the greeks in their formulations of Uh, war strategy right an attack so if they have those predictions and they have that all plotted out on this antikythera device then presumably they have a one-up on their enemy so that was very cool i thought yeah so yeah very superstitious Um, obviously right like uh, in a way you know what though i honestly don't think so be well um, yeah sure to yeah obviously they have their own mythologies and stuff but at the same time that makes a lot of sense because of the effect that it would have had on the tides, right? Ah, okay. So presumably, yeah, the weather and um, the tidal uh, patterns could have influenced, which right. could have ended up... Because, like, essentially what happened was their ships got grounded. Okay, and sure. Then, and then they lost about half of them. So I'm not oh, sure okay. if that was to weather, if that was I because see. of the offensive going on. I don't know. Who knows? But essentially, not a good time to attack. <laughs> no, yeah. For multiple reasons, maybe. But and you know, know what that also makes me think, too? It's like, clearly, something like this had obviously happened many times before. You know what I mean? Like the reason, like if if the one of the main functions of the yeah. uh, antikythera mechanism, and how the mechanism, will be in tune with that? Hey? Well, exactly, right? Like obviously, one of these main functions why it was made, if it was for war purposes, then clearly there'd been some other experiences with solar and lunar eclipses related to war before it was built. Yeah, well, it definitely wasn't um, contained to just that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, one definitely. of its functions. One of them. Yeah, right. which is really cool, yeah. right? This is almost like the ultimate device that any ruler would want to have at his side at all right. times, almost. Yeah, because it's very full of knowledge, and just you can just—it's like a quick reference that you can literally just look at and be like, "Okay, this is happening, and totally. this is going to happen then." But essentially, it also took into a lot of other different things, and lunar cycles, yes, as well as the um, orbital cycle of the moon's axis. So I'm not even sure if I'm really saying that right, but essentially the moon goes through this nine year cycle where um, it's kind of like on an elliptical cycle, right? And it kind of wobbles almost. And that Mm -hmm. cycle, the actual axis of that um, goes through a nine year rotation. So it'll be back at its original point in nine years. And this device with all its mathematical genius is able, able to take into account that cycle and Believe me, people, if you go and watch that documentary, which we're not going to get into the math because I hate numbers. Well, I don't hate numbers, but I <laughs> suck at them. <laughs> but essentially, this is brilliant yeah. to the utmost degree. Yeah. And I, the more we dove into this, the more and more I just like had such an appreciation and fascination for this bit of technology that yeah. now looks like basically... Um, the worst end of a like storm drain lid (laughs) like it doesn't it doesn't look like much now right um it was the really the um you know the really advanced x-ray scans of it when you see like the digital rendering of it like when Mm. it's all layered together and when they figured that it would actually be you know 60 gears and not 30 gears and how detailed it was it's like it is insane it's really cool and it's not even um just keeping track of the cosmos it's also keeping track of things on the ground here on earth so a lot of um cultural events that were important to the greeks things like the olympics um, lots of different sporting competitions uh, were all recorded on this device that's so cool which is really neat yeah so it calculated the timing of all the olympic games um there was also some 
other more minor games that actually kind of help uncover where this device could have actually been made. Some people argue. There are so many different theories, though, as to where this device came from and who made it. Right. That it's... It's a lot of conjecture, but a lot of very smart, um, informed conjecture on the part of all these academics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So maybe let's get into that a little bit. Sure. Let's do it. Well, should we get into that? Or let's get into expeditions too, because we have all that to talk about. That would be really, really cool. Let's do it. Let's jump into expeditions. All right. So let's go through this, because there was three big ones. And the, um, the first one, obviously, was in 1900. So once that sponge diver initially found the device... They begin, uh, like, a pretty extensive um, expedition, but obviously this was hampered by very early technology in regards to diving, so they weren't really able to get that far down at a time. Essentially, all they had was a heavy bronze helmet for their diving equipment, and it was connected to a long rubber hose that was fed air by a manual crank at the surface. Right. This is a quote here. It says, The entire contraption allowed only five minutes of bottom time per person and require, requiring the excavators to rotate among 20 men at a time. Crazy. So crazy, but they did manage to uncover quite a bit. So they um, had a total of 36 marble statues, a handful of bronze ones, and all sorts of ceramic and glass containers, lamps, human remains, jewelry, all that kind of stuff. And and then, yeah, basically, they uncovered the mechanism as well. Didn't really know what it was until a couple years later. Um, but then fast forward to 1976, we have none other than Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau. Classic French Which sport. everyone will know. Uh, well, not everyone, but you know the name. You Even should if you know. don't know. You should know. Everyone should know. What are some of his main... <laughs> Achievements. Well, I, don't even said, know. I don't even know. But everyone knows the name just because of it. Yeah, so. Now that I'm like thinking, wait a second. <laughs> but anyways, him and a crew, they actually returned to the wreck um, with updated technology, obviously, and they recovered about 300 more objects. And they uncovered um, a lot of skeletal remains as well. From the crew. Yeah. Interesting. Passengers, crew. I'm not sure. It doesn't say exactly how many remains were found of how many individuals. Hmm. But again, there was another expedition between 2014 and 2016. It was led by a hugely diverse crew, um, Greek experts, uh, experts from the US, um, the UK, all over. And there was this one archaeologist named Brendan Foley, and he was sort of one of the 10 experts on the team. But he kind of, um, he was referring to the importance of the findings that were over a hundred years ago, he commented saying, it's an amazing cargo that was the light that shined on the Mediterranean. Hmm. People thought, oh my God, if this is down there, what else is? This wreck was really the birthplace of underwater archaeology. Very quote, cool. Which is so neat, I thought. Um, but yeah, so they had a lot of technology at their hands. They had a $1.3 million pressurized exosuit that they used to explore the depths of the wreck. So literally imagine um, Avatar style suit where you don't even, you're not even getting pressurized. Or sorry, it is pressurized, so you don't have to decompress when you come up. Oh, wow, crazy. So it's really cool, but it's also very uncomfortable ah. <laughs> for the timer. <laughs> okay. And they kind of, um, yeah, they, they they had about a year of training before they went down, because it was, it's, it's very, like, you see, um, there's pictures, and we can include those in our sources, too. But essentially, they've got, like, the arms, right, of the suit, but there's, like, 10 different appendages on each arm. So you can, like, have, like, all sorts of different things for, like, testing different ways or, like, doing different whatever. Okay. Which I thought was really cool. But essentially it's, like, being inside of a air shaft or, like, an air vent. It's kind of how it's really hot, really, like, stuffy, <laughs> really annoying. Um, and it says here, this is uh, another quote from Foley. He says, to navigate the exosuit, you must prop yourself up on a makeshift bicycle seat and place your feet lightly on its foot pedals, which control the thrust of the apparatus. Foley's team spent a, a year and a half training in the suit and as a result have fallen victim to severe bruising, skin doubles, and tender crotches. <laughs> 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 so not, not the nicest. I'm almost imagining the always sunny um, exercise bike. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh my god. Max, the Mac like, exercise bike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does he call that one again? I can't even remember. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> I don't even think it's appropriate. I for probably the show. not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so they use this suit among other sorts of things. So before they even went down, they mapped the entire floor of the wreck. It was about 
2.6 square miles. And... It, of wreck. Of of, of seafloor. Where there was pieces of the wreck. Exactly. That's it was a pretty, quite... That's extensive. It was, yeah. It was quite a violent wreck. And they actually uncovered a secondary Roman cargo ship in the vicinity of this wreck, which is also very cool. Okay. But essentially, even just the ships themselves are impressive. They're much larger than anything else that has been discovered in the area. Uh, about 500 meters long, according to one source. And... Uh, yeah, apparently, wow. again, they found so many things. They found bronze rigging for, like, the the mast. Like, it was, like, a rigging ring, so it would have okay. gone a- along, around the mast, I guess. Mm-hmm. And they also found, this was really cool, um, this is from whoi.com. I can't remember the acronym for that, but it was part of the research crew. Okay. And um, it says here, quote, a unique artifact that may have been a defensive weapon to protect the massive ship against attack from pirates was also discovered. So I don't know what they mean by that, but yeah, I'm, what do I'm, they mean by I'm that? equally curious about this device as well. But anyways, hmm. yeah. A sister device to the Antikythera mechanism, perhaps. It's some sort of... Or- if, well, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. I'm picturing anti, well, I don't even know, anti vest, like maybe it's like a torpedo or something. <laughs> oh, like an ancient torpedo. I don't know. I'm that really pretty, curious. Pretty they didn't crazy. go into any detail with that one, but yeah. So, so that's kind of the sum of the expeditions. They did uncover quite a bit more of the device, including some of those like needles that would have been on, like very similar to like a clock face needles that would have represented the movements of each planet. And unfortunately, the little orbs that the planets would have represented are, they haven't been uncovered, which, yeah. come on. They're, they're still like down beads. there somewhere, obviously, right? I mean, of course, they're so small and you don't know. They're never, they're probably buried under like meters of sand. Probably. Yeah. Unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, the question left, I mean, well, there's a million questions left, but it's just like, yeah, why, why was it on a Roman ship? And mm-hmm. what were they doing sort of where they sank, yeah. essentially, right? Like, um, I guess looking back into, into other, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just like accounts and records and stuff like that, that I suppose there was, they mentioned that in the documentary we watched that there was, um, some like storm activity in and around the time they yeah. believed that the ships yeah. would have been traveling that route. Cause that's exactly it. Yeah. So Greek technology on a Roman cargo ship. How did it sink, right? Was Mm. it rough? They think it was rough weather. Yeah. And that they were uh, heavily overloaded. True. That was the other aspect. Yeah, exactly. So, and we've seen that with countless other stories that we've covered. Actually, maybe not so much on the show, but uh, the USS Cyclops on our Patreon, overloaded. Very true. King John's carts, Um, overloaded. The Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, The Edmund Fitzgerald, Mm. overloaded. So, definitely makes sense that it sank. The question is, was it one of its kind, too? You know, um, you're left to think that we're left with that because it was one of its kind where it was found. It seems like the type of device that was it, was this just like a prototype, like meant to be go into further manufacturing that was going to like outfit every Greek ship. And it just never came to be because of who knows the plans for it being lost and nobody being able to recreate it. That's an interesting theory because again, yeah, there's so many different ideas as to who might've invented it, where it could have come from. There's the one theory that it was invented by Archimedes. The mathematician. Who, yeah, exactly, who lived in Syracuse. Syracuse, sorry. Yeah. And the one idea for on that tangent is that Syracuse was invaded by Romans. Uh, I can't remember which emperor or some emperor. It was around 200 BC. Exactly. He ordered, yeah, basically that everyone be killed except for Archimedes because he was obviously highly important. Special. And that... There were two devices taken from that raid, and they don't say what those devices were, but then unfortunately, you get the death of Archimedes. Um, Slaughtered by a Roman soldier. Yeah. Alleged, as the story goes. Exactly. Yeah. For no so good just to reason. Think of like what ec- other knowledge was lost. Right? I know. You so know that's mean? one mode of thought. There are a lot of other ideas, though. There's the idea that. Again, yeah, um, more spoils of war garnered by Julius Caesar, which would come much later because they think that the the actual um, sinking occurred in 60 BC. Okay. And there was another theory that's favored by Dr. Foley that suggests that the boat was transporting a bride of importance across the sea. Oh. And that these were all gifts for her marriage family, like, you know, kind of like dowry. That makes sense. And then this tragedy struck. Um, I don't really know if I'm sold on that one no there's another well it just seems 
bizarre that that amount of treasure and maybe it is it is well possible. it depends who it is right i mean if this was some you know whatever if this exactly, was the yeah. it just had so much more importance and so much more value and i feel like with the um the context of a second cargo ship too in the vicinity i feel like it was more so it, it seems more like a raid it, more like a raid or this other idea that it could have been part of just like yeah a roman um trade route um where they would go and collect all these wealthy valuables and then sell them to nobles who co- collected rare antiques and curiosities and whatever else okay yeah yeah so that that was one that was put forth in that washington post article i read but i don't know there's a ton of different ideas like what's your favorite idea like where this thing could have come from <laughs> I, well, I think it's, I think the idea that it could have been designed by Archimedes makes a, a whole lot of sense. Mm, there's not mm-hmm. a, there's not a ton of people, um, that we can really, I mean, there's a lot of really intelligent ancient Greek philosophers and mathematicians, physicists, things like this that potentially could have made it, but he seems the most likely, um, mm-hmm. you know, I wonder, I wonder if, if it's older even than when people think it could be, you know what I mean? If this well is, uh, I, I, I don't think... I'd have to jump back into Herodotus and see if there's a loose mention to anything like it or anything like that. The other thing that is yeah. going to sound kind of out of left field, but this whole story and this this object really makes me think, for some weird reason, of um, the recent episodes of Astonishing Legends on Gobekli Tepe and oh. just some of the the potential things that were going on at that site and the links to the cosmos and you know the the uh, the afterlife and different things like that. There's not, we don't get that connection necessarily with the um, Antikythera mechanism, but there is connections to Egypt, the Egyptian calendar, mm-hmm. which was closely linked to the ideas of life and death and the duat and these types of things. And they they found markings on the Antikythera mechanism that were indications, right? Didn't we come up with that in the documentary? Indications of what? That it that it uh, took some knowledge from ancient oh, Babylonian yeah. had, and ancient Egyptian calendars. It did have an ancient Egyptian calendar on it. Right. From one source I read. Right. Which is crazy. So it's like you have you have Greek calendars and their conception of the cosmos. Then you have ancient Babylonian influence, Egyptian influence. And all Sorry, these things not... added together make me wonder if there is some sort of more grand purpose for this thing that we can't figure out. Mm-hmm. It's more mm-hmm. than just figuring out the alignment of the planets for eclipses, for war, for crops, or whatever. Well, it it is pretty grandiose even just like the way that a lot of people will sum it up. It's basically, this one guy, Jones, who was part of the most recent expedition, he says here, it's like, in a single instrument, they were trying to gather a whole range of things that were part of the Greek experience of the cosmos. So, you're, yeah, I don't even know how much grander you can get with that. Like, yeah, I guess not. Well. <laughs> Unless you're using it to conquer the world. <laughs> no, but I guess my point is just, is just why? Is it just to have a physical marker to mm-hmm. travel through the ages that so, so the Greek conception of the cosmos will I, always yeah. be remembered? I think or so. Or is it because I you... think it's a celebration of the technology okay. and it's a, it's a mechanized example of their understanding of the cosmos. That, to me, is incredible. Very to true. Have all of these different systems working together and all these tiny, minute gear systems. It's insane. So, let me get this but, straight. You don't think there's an ancient uh, ancient alien connection no. here? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, kidding, I'm actually I'm kidding. going I'm going the anthropocentric humanist route here and I'm going to say this is a celebration of our ingenuity and our achievements. All right. And normally I don't champion that sort of whatever, um, but I'm going to do it this time. But anyways, um, there was another... I'm uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, just before we move on here, just because we're, pre- we're, we're preaching Greek, shout out to Tass Malice from the Starters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that out there. He's probably not going to listen to this, but we're gonna, I'm going to try and make him listen to it. So okay. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Okay, I have on. one other thing, just a little tidbit here. So like we talked about, um, there was a lot of uh, events and sports competitions that were kept track of on this mechanism. And one of these was a really minor competition that was held in Rhodes. And so uh, some researchers actually believe that this indicates that the device itself may have been manufactured in Rhodes. Huh. Just because to place significance on that just seems weird and out of place. If it came from different areas, and they might have done that for their specific locality. Right, yeah, no, for sure. And then also to support this sort of idea is the fact that much of the pottery found in the wreck are characteristic of Rhodes as well. And Hmm. I'm not sure exactly how... uh, how nuanced pottery was in each specific area of Greek 
life. Oh, it definitely would have been. Obviously, you and I aren't versed in that, but... I would imagine there's probably, like, stamps or some sort of, like, thing that they would press into it that would kind of, like... um, Indicate where you're from. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know, though. Who knows? But essentially, yeah, that's kind of coming down to the end of the road there. Mm We sort of... Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, though. It's like, where did this technology come from? Where did it go? And a lot of researchers are puzzled by the fact that this is the only one in existence. There isn't really another form of technology that is comparable and that still exists today, except right. for that one, I think it was like an 8th century astrolab that was brought forth by, was it 8th century or was it even later? I can't remember. It might have been later in like the 13th century. No, I think that, that, no, that sounds about right. Because yeah, no, it was about, yeah, it was about a, close to a thousand years after the right. anti- Antikythera mechanism. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, this amazing feat and this engineering, whatever, and mm-hmm. it's literally a thousand years more modern than, yeah. than what we're looking at, which is which is crazy. Exactly. So that is Arab in origin. So essentially what a lot of people think is that this technology kind of passed onto the Byzantine culture. Yeah. Um, I always remember like Emperor Justinian or Just Justin. Remember that guy we learned about in school and he was like, Super harsh realist. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> I know for sure, but when everything Byzantine, I always think him. But anyways, and then um, and then from there, it kind of passed into the Arab world and kept alive with technologies such as astrolabs and stuff. Yeah. More, less grandiose, less all-encompassing, but very intricate as well technologies. Right, which is just kind of funny though, right? Because here we have a you know a progression of close to a thousand years. It's it's dispersed this knowledge, yet the devices you see in that period are less complex. Mm-hmm. It's just I find that so interesting. I just honestly... esoteric knowledge gets just just um, diluted. Over yeah, time. totally. Or like the nuances, because like we even had this brief conversation after we watched that documentary, right? Where it's like, like they said, like one of their main ideas as to why it was never reproduced was that the inventor was killed or the culture was killed off or something. And one theory was the idea that it could have been um, Archie, Arch, Archimedes, sorry, right. Archie. Yeah. <laughs> Archie and <laughs> <an> Archie. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that kind of makes a lot of sense to me. And just the idea that ebbs and flows happen in every sort of culture and civilization. And a lot of the technology is confined to the upper echelons of the sort of technology elite you know what i mean like just like the the most knowledgeable people in our society and those are like the 0.01 percent of the population so like if they got wiped out the 99.99 percent of us left would not be able to reproduce that no or it would take it would take generations upon generations as long as we have the texts and the tech like you know like the literature to kind of refer to or something yeah because otherwise then you're just screwed that's just a cheat sheet though right because like because these people didn't have those yeah things no. And so that's kind of another explanation, right? So it's like if if the knowledge is lost with a mind or a couple minds, like, yeah. like gifted minds, and then they're just lost and that's that. But I don't know. I really love this mechanism. Yeah. I It still is revealing secrets to this day. It's continued to be studied by scientists from a, in Athens at Cardiff University, um, the Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki. <laughs> I don't even okay. want to say that. Um, it's also studied by X Tech Systems in the UK, which was the provider of the X ray technology that they used. They built a custom X ray to look at this device, and then they transported it to the device. They didn't even do it the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. Which you would think would be easier, right? But no, I guess not. Too too the risky. Clearance, too the clearance risky, would have right? been yeah. like, yeah, too much. But yeah, no, they're still researching it away. It's it's a it's an interdisciplinary and um, inter national yeah yeah international is the word (laughs) i'm uh yeah i'm looking forward to see what else uh, can come up from that before we jump into our next sort of story here though uh, we have a quick promo break Mm -hmm. um we haven't done well we did one last week but we haven't done a ton of these lately so it's nice to uh to do some more Mm -hmm. this one is uh for our show called faux fright podcast and it's hosted by noah logan and it's a great show you guys should go check it out it's basically Mm -hmm. very similar to us except more kind of focused on ghost stories paranormal stuff um he kind of goes around the u.s not literally but goes around the u.s metaphorically looks at the country's sort of historic locations and um, strange things that happen at those locations, starting with his uh, places right in his home hometown in Savannah, Georgia. So, yeah, take a listen to this promo and go check out Faux Fright Podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Noah, and I'm the host of the podcast Faux Fright. Faux Fright aims to examine the paranormal going on around us each day within the context of real-life history. I do my best to break stories down and learn as much as I can about the reality and the lore. There are shadows around us every day, stories just waiting to be told and dark corners waiting to be explored. 
You can listen to Faux Fright on most major podcast apps, and follow us on Twitter, at Faux Fright. I'm always looking for people to join the adventure, so keep a tight grip on your flashlight, check over both your shoulders, and follow me. And we're back. So yeah, make sure you guys go check out Faux Fright Podcast. It's always nice when we meet other shows. Like, we just met uh, yeah. met Noah on Twitter mm-hmm. the other day, so it was cool to connect with him. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we are now moving on to uh, something very different than mm-hmm. the first part of this episode. Very much so. So we, we're going from a 2000, possibly a little more older than that year old, uh, de- Greek device to an artifact found in a cave in southern Siberia that we've actually touched on before. And the reason I wanted to cover this on this Ancient Technologies episode is because it really does, like the Antikythera mechanism, force us to rethink the possibilities of what our ancient ancestors were capable of doing. So, we, like I said, we've mentioned this one before, and I believe it was during our Depths of Baikal episode when we mentioned the uh, Denisovans. So... Anybody who's read any of, like, Andrew Collins' work, and uh, definitely you'd be familiar with him if you listen to Astonishing Legends, because they, they um, talked about him a ton during the, their Go Back Like Tepe episode, yeah. and we covered him as well. So basically, he um, has done some research about this bracelet that's been found, uh, that was found in the Denisova Caves. Mm-hmm. Anyway, some, some basic background on the Denisovans, though, because this is so fascinating to me is basically a, a, a species of Homo sapien, right, that we only know about because of a finger, a pinky finger, mm-hmm. and three molars that were discovered in these caves in southern Siberia, sort of near the border of Kazakhstan, China. Mm-hmm. And what's so crazy about this is that we know that they roamed vast expanses of Asia, and they were using tools that were far more sophisticated than the other early humans that existed at that time. We know that they mated with other types of humans, but that they disappeared around 40,000 years ago. Hmm. And I feel like I've had conversations with people about this, and it was after that Depths of Siberia episode, where I feel like a lot of the times the consensus is like, oh, well, they disappeared, they were inferior. You know what I mean? Like, they kind Hmm. of disappeared from the record 40,000 years ago. Clearly, they sort of interbreeded, interpopulated, and just sort of died out, in a sense, because they... You know, maybe they didn't There's have no the technological evidence. advances or whatever, right? And they do have specific sort of DNA mito- mitochondrial chromosome things, right? That, yeah, like that... it's unique. Okay. Mm-hmm. But my sort of argument on the other side of that is that maybe there's a reason why they were so distinct to begin with. And it was just sort of the time of them to be on the on the way out, so to speak. The question that the Denisovans bring up is... Could there have been more sophisticated populations of ancient peoples that went through a cycle and then on the tail end of their prime, so to speak, to use a sports term or whatever, Mm -hmm. right, they would end up mating with Neanderthal, other different peoples like that, and slowly kind of disappear. The That's reason, interesting. Like, sorry, like, go, go ahead. What do you think of that? What do you think of that general idea? I, I, like I just said, I think it's interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I get what people say, right, when they say that it doesn't really make sense. Um, like, if they were so technologically superior, why would they have died out? Kind of that argument where I understand that because a lot of the times, like, that we have as far as historical precedence is that if you are more advanced, then you usually end up taking over the inferiors. Right. And instead of the other way around where you gen- become more and more, like, I don't want to say inferior, but just, like, as far as, like, technological capabilities. Mm-hmm. Um you know what I mean? Like, no, and that totally makes sense. And I and I unless it is another case of the Antikythera mechanism where the technology is lost along with a few gifted minds, right. like you know, an upper echelon of um, intellectual elite, and then they exactly. are gone. Yeah. And the reasons for that them being lost could be for a very variety of different reasons. And when if we're coming back to the Antikythera mechanism in ancient Greece and ancient this and that, well, that's one of the theories for like the the loss of Atlantis. Right? There was this massive geologic event, and we lost this place that was, uh, you know, full of great advancements and Mm -hmm. intelligent people beyond that around the rest of the world, right? Or even sabotaged by, say, Neanderthals or by other populations. Like, I, what comes to mind immediately is the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Like, what if there was some sort of um, sabotage or some sort of warfare that 
inevitably like resulted ancient in ancient human warfare like before warfare was really a thing totally, like Neanderthal yeah. on Denisovan that's kind of crazy to think or where they see some oh well, yeah I know this is getting really like I'm, I'm using all of my frameworks and preconceptions to kind of define this but what, what if they saw what the Denis- Denisovans were doing and they thought that it was basically their equivalent of witchcraft and heresy and so therefore they're like mm, need to be eliminated <laughs> this Quite is all possible. pure conjecture pure conjecture but it's interesting <laughs> because they did disappear and we don't find modern like any Denisovan DNA in modern peoples other than mm-hmm. some populations in basically Asia Minor and then according to Andrew Collins very small pockets of um, the Finnish population Nordic population in Finland oh, cool so but like you and I would not have any Denisovan DNA right. left in us it'd be just so dilute you wouldn't find it mm-hmm. but Anyway, so that's, I just wanted to kind of tee it up like that because they could have been more advanced. And the reason people think this is because of what was found. It is kind of crazy. So we mentioned this before. The oldest stone bracelet ever, ever discovered in the world was found in this cave on layer 11, stratum 11 of the, of the Denisova archaeological site. So the deepest layer? I believe it's the deep, I believe it was, yeah, the the least accessible layer. But basically. go down? Yeah. Each layer by layer? Yeah, sounds about right, right? (laughs) So we know that there were other sort of human populations in the area and stuff like that, and that there was, there's artifacts from various time periods in the area, but this bracelet was found and originally dated between 40 and 50,000 years old. Okay. So it's a stone bracelet. Offhandedly, that doesn't sound too special, right? Like it doesn't, but what they discovered shortly after this was that it this bracelet was just a piece of a larger item of jewelry okay. that actually had a con- um, connective pieces to it with a hole in the center and that's how it was connected to these other pieces of mm-hmm. the of the whatever this hole looked far too perfect to possibly have been chiseled out 40 50,000 years ago yeah then <laughs> to make things even more confusing they were redated and the new findings, this was coming out of an Australian research institute. And actually, there's no names linked to it. And that's a little bit kind of fishy for me, to be honest. But hmm. new findings came out basically suggesting that it's it's more likely to be dated between 65 and 70,000 years old. And this hole in the center of this bracelet, when looked at under the microscope, its striations show an indication of extreme high-speed drilling. All right, so that's the technology. So that's the technology aspect of this. Now, am I suggesting that ancient Denisovan people were sitting over here with their freaking bit drill, drilling a hole like they came up with something like that? No. <laughs> I, but but what, why this is so interesting is because when we look at the Antikythera Antic- mechanism, it's complicated, but it's also kind of simple in, in the same way. It doesn't, like, run on fuel. No. There's no, like... It's hand-cranked. It it was um, hand-crafted to using simple chisels and files. Right. So... So what we have here is at least this starting point of a conversation about what type of possibly simplistic version could could ancient peoples have come up with to basically recreate the... The high the speed, speed needed mm-hmm. to create such a precision drill hole on a piece of jewelry. And remember, this isn't like building a, you know, a, a shrine, massive monument where you'd have engineers of the of, of this culture figuring out a way to make something happen. This is just a bracelet that came from clearly somebody important. Mm-hmm. But this technology was being used on that scale, like jewelry, not like for building pyramids and cutting massive monoliths and crazy things like that. That to me if you believe any of this, is like an indication that clearly this technology was widespread because it wasn't just a one-off thing to build the thing you needed to survive or to represent your culture. Mm -hmm. This was like something you used for everything. Essentially. Jewelry, this and that, whatever. It kind of looks that way, right? right? Yeah, if this was, if, 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 you know, you could go another route. Like this has been described as a part of a bracelet. What if it was actually part of something else? Like, you know, like, not ornate, not... What if it was actually part of another work? This is, again, like, I'm, I'm pure conjecture. Right. The other thing that this... I just want to make the point here. The reason that they could tell that it was high speed is that the fluctuations were essentially non-existent. And, like, what I mean by that is, like, if you're using something that's rotating to drill a hole in something and the speed is changing as mm-hmm. you go, then there's going to be obvious fluctuations in the... Um, 
like the, pa- the pattern, on yeah. the, the striations, right? Mm-hmm. There's going to be noticeable difference. And in this, when they look at it, it is, it's uniform mm-hmm. as if the same speed was happening the entire time. So where is this device exactly. that made it? Right. We will probably never know. It's probably crushed under like millions upon millions of tons of rock that are in the lower crustal layers of the earth. Now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I love to imagine is that there are... Like, when we first stumbled across this article, when Ian sent it to our Facebook forum group, and I was looking through it, and I was immediately in my mind picturing exactly that, like, these geologic time scales where things exactly that, they get recycled back into the lower layers of the crust of the earth, and a lot of it we'll never find. And then, like, there are some, oh my gosh, what am I trying to think of? The Noah's Ark reference, where his ark was found way up in a mountain or something, and mm-hmm. so people think that that's part of a big flood or whatever or something like that but what if it was actually part of like an uplifting action of um like a geologic event occurring like a mountain building event right right? something like that right because you do get that every now and then right where you'll get um say geologists they'll find um ancient layers of um ocean crust embedded in miles high of mountain up in like say like chile or something yeah. i don't know that's a totally random example i'm not no but they do they says. do they find but that's yeah. what i'm trying to say right yeah. like all these different and a lot of it like this probably this machine that is responsible for making this bracelet bit yeah or the hole in it is probably <laughs> in one of those situations maybe potentially <laughs> that was immediately when my wild imagination went to <laughs> yeah um and what you were sort of describing is something that ties into the the third uh, little story that we want to touch on in this episode, but this one as well, mm-hmm. and that is um, <laughs> this this deserves its its own episode entirely, and we probably will do one just on the cerulean hypothesis. Mm. That's what all of this stuff is tying into, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. Okay. Not necessarily the Antikythera Antica mechanism, but definitely the Denisovan bracelet and this next story. And the cerulean hypothesis is essentially this idea that. Could it be possible to detect an industrial civilization in our geological record? And the pre- and what I mean by that is the premise of this um, research article, which has now been published, it's an academic peer-reviewed article, uh-huh. is that the idea that we've only been living in an industrialized civilization for the last 300 years of our human... Right. Of humans, yeah. right? That's a, such a minuscule fraction of time. Tiny little blip. That is a minuscule fraction of our human history, mm-hmm. not not to mention the Earth. history of complex life on Earth, which is mm-hmm. over 400 million years. So this paper is essentially positing the idea that if there was, you know, 350 million years ago, a record of some other pre-industrial, pre-human ability, technological ability, it would we be able to t- detect it? I don't know. Would it be found in rock stratum? Would it be found... You wouldn't be able to um, go with, like, ice core samples because that wouldn't go far enough. It wouldn't go far enough. But what what I I, I guess... How this ties into me to the Denisovan bracelet and this idea of that ancient tech is could people's, our ancient ancestors, you know, 70,000 years ago, have stumbled across something in that... in the time record, in the Mm. geological record, some sort of some sort of instructions or, or some, some sort of anything, anything to go off of. Right. And then that could be an explanation of why we see, and here's the first time we're using this word today, the anachronistic technologies, technologies that should not be there. They are out of place, you know? And I first learned that word and, Oh, what was that movie we watched where it was like, Oh, (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'll, I'm going to find it because that's going to kill me. Where it was basically like, it was supposed to be like a period piece though in like the 1800s. And then all of a sudden there's a helicopter coming in to like drop, oh. drop stuff. And it's like, wait, that shouldn't be there. Like that's not supposed to be there. Oh yeah. What is that? Oh, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. So essentially that's what we mean. That's interesting Jack, right? that you're saying like basically there could have been a handbook. There could have been some instructions that was uncoded. You know, it's interesting. We didn't actually, I forgot to mention this when we were talking about the Antikythera mechanism, but um, apparently there is sort of an instruction manual of sorts that really? is attached to the, and it's not like what you would say where it's like, it's not telling you how to use it, but this guy Jones essentially says it's like, what you will see is such and such. Like, you know, like as if it's almost like a museum plate, like this here is blah, 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 <laughs> like, you know, which is kind of funny. Yeah. But that's interesting though. That, but the only problem with that is like, even if they had access to such a 
manual or such an instructions, whatever, how would they have been able to interpret it? Well, that's <laughs> just it. That's just like us, right? Now, 2,000 years later with the Antikythera mechanism, yeah. uncoding ancient Greek symbols and stuff. So yeah. it's not like it's not possible. It's very interesting, though. But what I, if... I like that. Here's my theory for that. What if the possible thing that, yeah, ancient peoples found was, yeah, like you, you say, how would they have interpreted it, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what if it was literally laid out in like hieroglyph? Oh, true. Where it's like images. showing you literally images as if you were trying to show a three-year-old how to put the triangle shape in the tr- in the triangle shape for his, ancient like, his Ikea playhouse Ikea toy, right? <laughs> no, not Ikea instructions, because then they would never get it built. <laughs> It would be like they'd build, they'd be like, wait, wasn't this supposed to be bunk beds? It kind of looks like a giraffe. Like, not really sure. But, it's a uh, raft. Yeah. Mm, yeah, great. I wonder if it'll float. Yeah, probably not. So that's, that, I, I love that. Anyway. It's a very interesting, because here we get an artifact that is associated with the technology. It's not the technology itself, but it is a product of yeah. such. Yeah, which is why it's a little different from the Antikythera mechanism, a little bit of a shift. Mm-hmm. And so much more to unpack there. Um, we'll definitely come back to that. I, I recommend to. going looking into some of Andrew Collins' work. It's definitely fascinating. It is. He definitely interjects a lot of his own opinions and theories and ideas. Yeah. But he always ba- he usually will premise it by saying he's giving his opinions. But he's, he's super he's, fringe, but he's good. He's fringe, yeah. That's a good way to phrase it. Because yeah. there are some ideas that you might think are awesome and incredible, cool. And then there are some that are like, that's just bad shit. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, a little bit. Like, he even has... He has a lot to do with... He loves to connect um, astrology and the cosmos and the sky, like sky maps um, and how the constellations kind of fall into that. And he's a lot of ideas on like the North Star and whatever. And we touched on him briefly when we did the um, Giza underworld yeah, and the pyramid of, or sorry, the tomb of the birds and um, yeah, Giza's underground and how that all connected and the star shafts and stuff. We didn't really get too far into that one, but that would be another thing we have to revisit, eh? Yeah, we'll have to come back to that. We love that stuff. We will. But not today. Not today. Not we today. are um, finishing <laughs> not off... Not tonight. No. no. Not tonight. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody who... You, okay, anyone who gets that reference, they get um, they get free into the portal pins. So yeah. if you know where that's from, please get us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm curious to see if anybody will know where that's from. <laughs> I love it, because I was thinking in my head the other day, I was like, we haven't thrown out one of those in the last couple of weeks, so we need to do that. But anyways... Yeah. Um, let's get into our last story of the Let's evening. do it. And that is none other than, I don't even like to call it this, but I'm going to call this anyway because it's what it's most known by, and that is the London Hammer. We are, this is our hoax story of the night. It basically is. It's been proven without a doubt to be a hoax, I would say, in my mind. Or not even proven, but they won't even give you the tools or the access to, to prove it one way this or the other. This is the only time where an I am going to say this is a case where absence of evidence is evidence of absence. It's mm. this proof that this thing is not legit, but worth mentioning anyway, because it's a part of the larger conversation that ties into yeah. the Cerulean hypothesis. So Amber, what's oh, this all about? Right. So basically this story picks up in 1936 um, it's called the London Artifact or the London Hammer most often, but basically this was an iron and wood hammer that was found by local hikers in a creek bed near London, Texas. Not London, England. This that just is... seems like such a bizarre name of a place in Texas. I We've don't know come why. I've across quite a few of those recently where I'm like, yeah. whoa, like they're just, uh, London, they're just they're Texas. stealing names, man. Anyways. Like what's next? Like, I don't even know. I can't even, okay. I can't think of anything. I can't think of a funny thing to say, but <laughs> what's, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So the story goes that this guy, Max Edmund Hahn and his wife, Emma, were out walking along this path on Red River. And, um, this was obviously in London, Texas. They noticed this bizarre looking artifact kind of sticking out. And basically it was described by, um, them as a rock nodule with a piece of wood sticking out from it, sitting on a ledge near a waterfall. It wasn't Ooh. attached to anything solid around it. And so the couple picked up the artifact and brought it home and, um, they got their son to actually take a hammer and chisel, huh, irony abound, huh. but, um, yeah, so he took a hammer and he essentially chiseled it out of the stone. And they basically noticed that it it seemed to be an ancient hammer of sorts. Okay. Okay. So we're looking at predominantly limestone for the rock. We're looking at a uh, environmental situation where we have a waterfall. 
So we have water action and we have limestone. Hmm, what do you get when you put those two together? Massive erosion. Massive erosion and just um, redeposition of limestone materials from one place to another, like downstream. So you will see, just look up any example of limestone for me. Like, you know, everyone knows what Sure, sure. About. So, but, but why was this so special, Amber? <sighs> Allegedly. Well, supposedly the rock that was encasing the hammer was dated to the Ordovican period, which is more than 400 million years ago. 488, to be exact. Exactly. Uh, so this period, I just pulled up a couple um, quick facts about it. So it lasted about 45 million years old, beginning in... Uh, beginning about 488 million years ago and ending about 43, or sorry, 443.7 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And this was um, basically a time where there was almost like two um, supercontinents, um, the Gondwana, and then there was also another more northerly one. But essentially it was almost, um, it was almost entirely ocean in the northern half of the world. And uh, most of the world's land was collected in the southern... Oh, sorry. It was one supercontinent called Gondwana, which oh, eventually crazy. split into two okay. bigger ones. But essentially, um, yeah, during this period, it shifted towards the South Pole and then much of it was submerged underwater. But it's best known for um, a diverse amount of marine invertebrates. Um, so trilobites, branchiopods, conodotes, I don't even know. <laughs> Close early, enough. early vertebrates. <laughs> So that's essentially what we're looking at. Lots of cephalopods, corals, things, gastropods in the neck of the woods. No, um, no humans, supposedly. Supposedly. <laughs> not according to, uh, and, and really, I hope we, we're not intending to offend anyone who is uh, religious, oh, but no. um, definitely this is one of the um, things tied to early creation. Well, let's just say, yeah, it's tied to creationist ideas. It's been appropriated um, under the early creationists. Um, right. What what do they call? Do they call themselves the early creationists or like the? Um, Basically, the the people who claim that humans were around for this period and possibly all the way up through like uh, during the dinosaurs era with the dinosaurs. Oh, sorry, young Earth creationists is what ah. they're called. Sorry, I knew there was an actual word right. for it. But, and, yeah, anyway, continue. Okay, so basically, <laughs> the rock, like we said, is dated to about 400 million years. It does, rock can exist for a lot, like especially limestone, right? And then it can wrap itself uh, basically around and erode itself around objects such as a hammer. Right. Um, so essentially, that is the counter argument to a lot of people that are saying that this is of modern origins. Yeah, well, and here's my other thing about that. I, I'm not, and I'm not a, uh, I'm not a scientist, but... I'm fairly certain <laughs> that um, anything made of wood, even if it was like petrified, preserved in like an amber or some sort of something that could preserve it for millions, hundreds of millions of years, the, I'm just guessing, but I'm going to say I'm willing to put money that the second that that wood that's that old is exposed to oxygen, it's going to turn to freaking dust. That's a really good point. And on top of that, it would have turned to coal a long time ago. <laughs> Well, that's one of the article's claims that it was starting to turn to coal. Oh, okay. And it, it, it looks like, like literally just, it look, when you look at photos of that, it's just like a little tiny corner that looks like it was singed. It's like you can see like the price tag on it says freaking water. <laughs> so it's a like, lot of people, a lot of um, modern archaeologists and um, experts in their fields will say that this is basically a 19th century quarryman's um, tool, like yeah. for quarrying rock. And um, that essentially would have fallen into the Red River near the waterfall because there's a rock quarry nearby. And that it would have been, over the course of 100, 200 years, it would have been um, um, eroded into this material, right? Mm -hmm. Into this limestone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's hilarious. Okay, so one of those articles I was reading about this thing, when I was, in the, I was enamored by this initially before I started digging in um, a little deeper. Yeah. And one article states, like, right off the bat... That this hammer um, was five, or sorry, not five million, it was 500 million years old, putting it almost a full hundred million years ahead of the rock casing. So they're trying to, I don't even know, and, and but the same <laughs> article closes by saying that the hammer itself has not been carbon dated. It's 500 million years old and we can tell by looking at it. It looks real old. 
What? Yeah, so do those dry pizza crusts on our counter. Like, pretty sure they're not 500 million years old. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I really want pizza. Anyways. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> but another um, thing that people will point to that this is, like, of ancient um, human manufacture um, is the fact that the head of the hammer is 96% iron, suggesting intellectual manufacture, intelligent manufacture, sorry, not coincidence or nature, hmm. which no one will argue against that. If you actually look at the photo itself, it's very clear that this thing is of man origins, like, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, but that's not to suggest that it's ancient by any means either. Right. So we're going to get into a little bit of controversy. Um, you kind of dug this up, this first bit here. So, hey? yeah, so, like, basically... The hammer's been promoted by a guy named Carl uh, Bog. Is that how you would pronounce Bo, it? I think it's probably. Like Bo? B-A-U-G-H. Yeah, okay. Carl. Yeah. Well, well. I'm going to call this guy whatever. Like Bo's whatever Polly? I feel huh? like. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, he calls anything else what he Carl feels like. Carl Bo. He's, um, yeah. So, I mean, here's the thing. I just want to state this for the record. That since we've started doing this show, I, I, Amber and I are both pretty much, you know, we're agnostic, Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of have to be when you're talking about paranormal, you have to be open and because we don't have the answers to these things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have to say that doing this show has definitely opened my mind to a lot of other things, including, um, the historic, uh, credibility of, of religion and primary sources in like the old Testament and different things like that. So I just want to at least say that where I'm not discounting all, we're not using this as like a, you know, to say, to just cross off no, all exactly. religious history or not anything like that. Not a blanket like coding argument at all. Um, no. But anyway, so yeah. But it's just that there are quacks out there and there this are. guy yeah. is a quack and I think that's almost being respectful calling him that because a lot of people have a lot dirtier words I think for it's him. disrespectful to ducks. Quite <laughs> frankly. Um, yeah, no. Uh, Carl Bo, he, um, he basically <laughs> claims that... Uh, Okay, wait, where am I here? I'm okay, lost. this was, I had a really fun quote. This is kind of a long one, but I thought it was Just kind of it. interesting. It's, it's good, yeah. Okay, so, quote. <clears throat> it was Bo who dubbed the hammer the London artifact, which means that all claims using this term ultimately go back to his authority. Bo is regarded with scorn, even by other creationists, for his promotion of dubious and even fraudulent objects. Bo has even tried to use the hammer to show that rock could form in a very short time. Um, this is in brackets, like young creationists everywhere. He ridiculously attributes the formation of the geologic column to the effects of Noah's flood, um, end bracket, um, and that the people of the time of Noah were skilled metallurgists and that the Ordovican rock from which he claimed it had come from could not be anything like as old as science asserts. So he's basically saying, he's going the opposite route. He's not saying that this artifact is... 400 million years old because he is a creationist but um anyways he's equating it to the time of noah which i'm not even sure in his mind what period that would have well, been this is, this is along the lines of like people saying the earth is only like six million years old or something right mm-hmm. so it goes on to say um he continues to promote objects that have long since been debunked this includes the london hammer about which the creation slash evolution journal devoted two pages to a rebuttal of Bo's claims. And this was by a guy named uh, John R. Cole. So quote continues here. It says, this was in the year after his museum opened, yet he ignored the criticism for years. Instead, he continues to use it as evidence for high technology in the distant past and the relatively recent formation of much of the geologic column during this mythical flood of Noah. One of his principal selling points is the allegedly impossible composition of the iron in the hammerhead. So, yeah, so he's kind of all over the map. He's totally all over the map because Mm -hmm. here's the other thing, too, about that. Like, that's just, I'm I'm sorry, just to harp on some creationists a little bit here. You've got him saying, this is how old the rock is, and I'm acknowledging that. But then I'm also saying that Uh, the hammer itself is only X amount of years old. He's not even saying that, though, because he doesn't even think that. He's basically saying that rock can form overnight. (laughs) Is kind of his argument. And I didn't say that. What, what I was kind of implying when I say, like, um, the limestone could have been um, covered, like, the rock, the rock could have been encased in limestone. Yeah. That's a totally different form. That's not a creation of rock. That is no. just a transference of the that's composition. The, yeah, that's just the, sh- yeah. Yeah. The shape of it changing and anyone will, anyone. And the molecules re- rearrange. If you go out and look. With on the influence your, of water. If you go out and look on your driveway where there's a leak from a gutter, you're going to see some erosion. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's not. Limestone's it, very soft rock. Yeah. But anyways, it's not even that. But like, he is such a little bugger, in my <laughs> opinion. He doesn't allow any testing to be done on this 
exhibit. Right, which of course is just proof in and of itself that yeah. it's a total If he had no hoax. fear of um, any of this, then... But that's just it, though. He doesn't actually abide by the conventions of science, right? Well, so of course, he, none of these people do, right? No. They, they, they're like, oh, the Earth is only six million years old, and be like, oh, well, what about this dinosaur skeleton? Six well, million I get, years or, old. Or six, six thousand. thousand years, sorry, six yeah. thousand years old, and it's like, oh, well, what about, uh, what about this thing over here? And it's just like, oh, yeah, no, that was just... <laughs> I mean, just uh, that's misinterpreted. <laughs> misinterpreted. That's like fifty-five years old. That uh, that T. Rex skeleton over there. Oh, okay. That's good. No, that's just great. a couple of decades. Yeah, just a couple. Just a couple of decades old. Yeah, no big deal. Um, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it, the, the reason we wanted to include this is because it was an interesting contrast to the other two um, things we've covered. Mm-hmm. Because we have, like I said, the Antikythera mechanism, which is this definitively real. You know ancient device that we still don't technically know exactly what it was for other than the fact that it was related to the ideas of the cosmos and different things like that then we've got potentially ancient technology being used by people 70,000 years ago and possibly linked to the ancient Denisovans Mm -hmm. and this is sort of related to it obviously because of the idea of the cerulean hypothesis could we find things in our geological record that would indicate advancements in technology. Did we define what the Cerulean hypothesis is? Yeah, I did. Sorry. Yeah. So it's oh, basically, okay. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, basically just the idea oh, that. Oh, the industrial civilization right. on a geological record. Exactly. Okay. okay. So I feel like this London hammer, this is, was trying to, unless you, unless you're going by the, the bur, the, the bow definition of it, it's, it is essentially trying to, uh, prove that hypothesis in a way, right? It's, it's yes. saying here, we found this object, um, in the ancient time record, and, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't even know. It's kind of, um, I don't even know. It definitely gets the conversation going, even though this is clearly total BS um, with the London Hammer. Like, I'm just going to... It's interesting, It's though. interesting nonetheless. And I find it fascinating just the fact that this hammer that was so relatively recent just got encased in such a bizarre way. And yeah. and what's also interesting, too, in that same chunk of limestone, there's um, un unfossilized um like cretaceous shells or sorry not cretaceous that's a that's a period <laughs> geological period but you know like um shells of like a of a just a shell <laughs> like you know that would have housed a, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Like from like ancient trilobites and different things like that like no not even it's not ancient no, oh it's like no, super no. modern yeah it's just a shell like that you find on the beach so it's so it's even this just so gets even less juicy that's then for interesting this. too right because like what how old is the shell i don't know Oh, well, we'll never know because old Carl doesn't let you <sighs> take a look at their dare about it. Carl, come on. But, uh, yeah, honestly, I, I think I think we're okay without looking at this hammer from, from Carl. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to know, and we're going to look into it. We only we, we don't want to go more than an hour and a half per episode. No. <laughs> but uh, there's definitely more stuff out there um, that that could that we could have included in this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, the Baghdad battery, Ooh, yeah, that's a good um, one. Is a, is a good one, which of course they sort of semi debunked on MythBusters, um, showing that you would have needed way more of them to actually generate enough energy off of what would have oh, fit in it. Okay. Um, but could it have been used for something else? Who knows, right? Maybe. So if you guys have other things that you know of related mm-hmm. to this anachronistic technologies, ancient technologies, things that shouldn't be where they are. Mm-hmm. We were going to include the drop of stones in this episode, but we realized that sort of looking into it, it's like, well, you know, it's, more of an artifact, it's and... an artifact linked to other sort of fringy things, not necessarily related to the cerulean hypothesis, hypothesis and mm-hmm. that sort of thing, more mm-hmm. ancient alien kind of stuff. Mm, yeah. So we'll get to that eventually, but <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but this this is what gets my, keeps my juices flowing, is this kind of stuff. The idea of what we can find in our ancient past, what was capable in our ancient past. And I feel like this is the this is the current running through all our episodes, right? This totally. is through the, uh, the Giza underworld, especially, and, mm-hmm. and ones like that. Ultimately, like, okay, if you're to kind of mash these three things we've talked about today, today together and kind of come up with a sort of a... A concluding statement or, or thoughts, where would you be at on that? Well, I'd just say that a lot of the times our conventional ideas and narratives are exploded by these finds that seemingly come out of nowhere. Yeah. A sponge diver. Just, yeah. Just, you know, like that's crazy. Totally. And I loved that quote that I read earlier from that guy Jones that was part of the expedition about how this is basically like it opened up Pandora's box as far as underwater archaeology. And that to me is 
crazy because that's a huge wealth of like you know like how many shipwrecks how oh, many whatever like you know like so that's absolutely. cool to me just the opening of the doors of possibility to widen our understanding and to appreciate what ancient cultures and civilizations were capable of totally yeah. totally I, and i i guess i would have to just sort of yeah steal that answer and say the same thing because because mm-hmm. that's really what these do and even with the london hammer it keeps the conversation going yeah as long as you don't believe word for word verbatim what this guy's saying and that's Keep obviously pursuing... a small small percentage of people that are buying yeah. into that crap but yeah. um just keep pursuing knowledge, right? And keep just... pursuing knowledge. Keep your minds open. Critical yeah. thinking. Mm-hmm. We try to, I think, beyond anything else, promote critical thinking on the episode. Yeah. On these episodes and on the show. Definitely. So let us know what you think of this one. Yeah. Hit us up um, into the portal mailbox at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. You know where to find. You know where to find us everywhere else. Yeah, we have that awesome forum on Facebook. So make sure if you like our page, um, click on the group button mm-hmm. and come join that as well. Yeah. And and then as well, we're always on Instagram, Into the Portal Podcast, and Twitter at Into the Portal One. Come join us; we're always active on there. Definitely, and especially I, Andrew. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely me. And uh, <laughs> I'm just I'm really curious to see what you guys think of some of this stuff. You know, this was maybe a little bit of a less focused episode, talking about multiple different things, but all related to this our ancient past. And we really want to know what you guys think about the possibilities of our ancient past. So yeah, hit it, please hit us up. Mm-hmm. And uh, do we have anything else we want to finish off on? Do we know what movie we're doing next week? Oh, yeah. I think we're going to do The Ruins. The Ruins. All right. Unless you're going to put your foot down and say we have to watch The Descent. But no, I, no, no. I'm going to say let's let's go with that. We had a, Because a multiple... we did The Man-Eating Plants. Exactly. So. We had multiple people recommend The Ruins. So make sure you guys go watch that film. And uh, we, we'll, be, uh, we'll be back on Friday with that film Friday episode. And, Hope uh, you're enjoying that Donnie Darko. Go uh, yeah. check it out if you haven't yet. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, until next week.